What's up, Temple? What's up, Philly? What's up, world? Welcome to Philly Famous Podcast. My name is Greg Holtzman, and I'm the creator and host of the show. I'm a lifelong Philadelphian, graduate of Central High School, former college basketball player, and current senior at Temple University. I launched the podcast nearly a year ago, and you can find the 75-plus episodes published on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, Google Podcasts, our website at phillyfamouspodcast.com, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. The show highlights Philly's most dynamic creators and leaders who are doing interesting and innovative things in all areas of professional life, from the legends of our city to the next generation of up-and-comers. Our guests are diverse in race, gender, age, neighborhood, and industry, ranging from entrepreneurs, athletes, musicians, politicians, doctors, and more. My guest today is a host and anchor for NBC Sports Philadelphia. He has held roles as a reporter for both local and national networks, including work for USA Network, HBO Sports, and CBS. He was also the co-host of the Mike and Ike show on 94 WIP on weekday mornings from 10 to 2. He is a five-time Philadelphia Sports Emmy Award winner and has been named Pennsylvania Sportscaster of the Year seven times. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome on a true Philly legend, Michael Barkan, to Philly Famous Podcast. How are you doing, Michael? Greg, what's up, buddy? <laughs> That's, it's just like I wrote it. That's phenomenal. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll, I'll submit it a little earlier next time. How you doing? I'm good. This those, is fantastic. Those blue rim glasses yeah. pop more in person, but they've become like your, your look. What, what's inspired them? Uh, my father-in-law, who is a, a proud Temple alum, my mother-in-law, a proud Temple alum, and my wife, a proud Temple alum. So I just wanted to get that in there. Okay. But I was wearing the glasses that, that you had uh, in the photo that you showed at the very beginning of the program. And my father-in-law was saying, you know, the, those glasses are boring. They make you look older. And I said, they don't make me look older. I thought, if I ever forget my glasses, because they're not a major prescription, but I do need them to see distance, read the prompter, uh, and, and read from here. If I ever forgot them in the newsroom, or as the, the content room, as we now call it, uh, if I ever forgot them, I would be on the set with no glasses, and it would be less abrupt than if I had glasses like these. So now I just don't forget my glasses in the content room. But he, <laughs> he, he, he said, like, ju juice it up a little bit. What was the initial reaction to the glasses? Uh, mostly good. Uh, it's funny because women like them, men don't. <laughs> Um, in, in many cases, but uh, I'm getting more and more guys on board. I think part of it is, you know, growing up here in Philadelphia, man, we want things the way they've been forever. I don't want any kind of change, nothing, not especially not from the guy who's coming into our home every single day. He had rimless glasses. Now he's got blue glasses. I hate him. So, so well, I, I do like them in, a while. in when I watched the pregame and postgame Sixers show with, uh, with Mark Jackson and, and Jim Lynham. You know, you've had several co-hosts in the past. What's, what are your strategies to build that chemistry with, with them? That's a very interesting question uh, because I am one, I like to get along. I like to be liked. I like to like other people. Some people don't care. And, and I say to that, bravo, that's great. But I, it's, it's always better, as a friend who says, to play nice in the sandbox. And so I look, uh, you were a point guard, weren't you? I was a point guard. I look at myself as a, as a point guard. I'm just, trying facilitate. To, I'm just trying to facilitate. I'm just trying to set you up. And, um, you know, I, I have enough knowledge that I can ask coaching questions and bring out what I think is the best in the analysts that I work with. But I, I do believe that if you truly, you know, uh, are on the same playing with someone mentally and emotionally, it makes for a better program. You know when to back off. You know when you can slip in a joke. You know when you can interrupt. You know a lot of different things about that person that make it um, more comfortable for the viewer. Well, how important is it to get to know them personally off air? Uh, that's not as important. I, I always like to think that, I, always, I do think that if anybody who I work with needed me for any reason, that I would be there in their personal lives, and I would. But uh, it's more important to, to um, get along uh, in a work venue and um and that that's the most important thing i am friends i work with ricky vitalico i'll see ricky vitalico socially same with jimmy line time to time jimmy plays we have a charity uh, our family has a charity we have a golf outing every year jimmy plays all all those guys al morganti they all uh play in in that golf outing and i i feel honored but that to me that's a personal thing that extends a little bit uh, beyond the realm of what we do in the studio so you do have some personal relationships off off air yeah You've been at the forefront uh, of sports media for over 20 years, over 20 years. Um, why do you think you've been well, able to... Well, you said forefront. I'm just saying <laughs> I've been in sport, sports media for 20 years. So, but why do you think you've been able to stay so relevant uh, in the sports media world for so long? Uh, 
Again, another good question. I think part of it is, what's the old line? Half of it or 75% of it is just showing up? Mm -hmm. Well, that's one. I mean, I, I show up. I show up on time. I like to think I'm prepared. Uh, and the, the biggest thing is I'm into it. I, there's so many other things that I could have the misfortune to do in my life, uh, like working on a road crew or, or doing other things that would be less exciting than what I do right now. So I realize how blessed I am. And and um, and I love sports, and I love to talk about. I'm not into. I always say I hate the salary cap talk, but I love a good play. I, I love the excitement of what happens late in the game. I love what happened the other day with with Jimmy Butler with that last second shot beat last the night? Nets well, last night. Well, this is this might not air for That's another month or so. That's why I said the other day. Okay, <laughs> this it was uh, it was late November with Jimmy Butler <laughs> against the Nets. Thanks that shot against the Nets uh, at Brooklyn, and. Um, that's why I got into it, and I'm still just as excited about it today as I was when I was a kid. And, and, um, but the big thing is knowing that you're blessed and, uh, as Tony Robbins would say, living each day with an attitude of gratitude, you got to do that. So, When in your career do you feel like you really found your live TV voice? Um, I, I feel like I found it when I came back to Philadelphia. I was at Channel 3 for a while. First, I was at New Jersey Network, New Jersey Public TV. And um, I'd come up there. I worked at NBC News in Washington. I was a desk assistant, news assistant. Up, and, and I thought, well, what I really want to do is report on sports. Went to New Jersey Network. New Jersey Network led to Channel 3. Worked at Channel 3 for five years. At the end of that time, did not get my contract renewed. And that's when I talk to young people. I always say adversity. You know, it's, and that's not easy to go through. And you're going to face adversity in your life at some point. When you face that adversity, what do you do with it? So, so um, what I did was I got another gig up in Boston. I worked in Boston for four or five years and at the same time started to filter in um, the, the network stuff that you mentioned at the beginning of the program. But I also started to do talk radio up in Boston. And that was very important because I'd never been much of an extemporaneous speaker. It's difficult to do. And what was the word you just used? Extemporaneous? extemporaneous? Yes, extemporaneous. The ability to talk fluently without a script. And, and to, uh, you know who does it amazingly well? The, probably the best at it, Bob Costas, Al Michaels, Mike Tirico. Um, they, they are the best extemporaneous speakers that I ever heard. John Kennedy was a, was a great extemporaneous speaker. And, and you'll find many of the politicians, perhaps not surprisingly, that come out and make stump speeches or open up uh, supermarkets or libraries or whatever, they're also able to show up and, and be very good extemporaneously. So being able to do that on the radio, and then when uh, Comcast Sportsnet at the time, Philadelphia called, and two of my dearest friends still in life, Tom Stathakis and Jim Cudahy, said, um, they, I work with them at Channel 3, said, we're putting a band back together. You want to come back? And I didn't know if I did, because I, I had a life in Boston. Um, uh, your friend, my daughter, Emily Barkan, was born in Boston, so there was a real attachment to that city. And, and um, um, I, I didn't know, they say you can never go home again. And I really felt that Philadelphia was home. Um, but the, the name Comcast, and what I thought we would be able to do with what they were setting up would be just amazing. So. That really is when I began, began to find my, my live voice, on-air voice, being able to have an opinion, just being able to host a show, and, and um, all of it was, was through, I think, the adversity of leaving Channel 3, going to Boston, coming, doing the sports talk radio, coming back here, and, um, and just feeling like this is, this is it. It's my time. Well, how similar is talk radio to, to live TV? Um, Talk radio and live TV certainly are similar in, in that you're giving your opinions, but the, the break structure is different. So, talk, and you're dealing with the, the callers on talk radio, although we had, we had callers when I first started at Comcast Sportsnet. I used to host this show called Spotlight. Uh, on TV? At, on TV, yeah. And I would sit in a chair, we'd go over the day's sports news, and I'd take calls. And I said, do we have a delay? And they said, no, we don't need a delay. I said, are we at least calling the people back? So as if to say, we know where you live. Nah, we don't need to do that. It'll be fine. Finally, you know, we got a call. Someone said, bleep, bleep. <laughs> we had a delay the next day. But, but um, the, the, um, I think there's, there's more back and forth in sports talk radio because you, you're dealing with the callers. You're dealing with an outside voice, if you will. And uh, in, in studio, in, in television, you can still have those arguments and discussions 
but everything's packaged in a half an hour or an hour and not in three or four hours as it is in sports talk radio. So you got to you got to wind it up a little bit more quickly. Well, that's actually what I like about podcasts is that you're able to have the flexibility of time. There's no rush. Yes. <laughs> yeah, how long is this podcast? Well, the TV is a little bit short. This is about 20, 26 minutes probably. Yeah. It's but really, my, my, like my longer episodes are like an hour, yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever it ends up being. That's what mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned some, some of the, you know, the more well-known voices like Al Michaels, Bob Costas. Who were some of the other uh, personalities that you may have admired and, and tried to emulate when you first started? I loved, it's, it's funny, television is, is such an important media, it's, a, it's probably the most important invention, one of the most important inventions, other than advances in medicine, of our time. And you're going into people's homes. And so the, the guy who used to come into my home all the time was Jim McKay, who, who passed away 10, 10 plus years ago, and he was the host of Wide World of Sports. I don't know if you ever remember it. It was on since you've been alive, but, but it, it's been gone for a little while now. And Wide World of Sports was a, a, a show, a magazine show, where they would take you live to um, ice motorcycle racing in Russia, or weightlifting in Des Moines, or, or fly fishing in, in Montana, or, or big game fishing, or you know, big fish fishing out in the, in the ocean. And it was all sorts of different sports and interviews. And, and Jim McKay was the host, and he was also the host of ABC's Olympic coverage. And when you go into people's homes, that's, that's, a, that's a major deal, and he came into mine. And I used to hang on his every word, and he was great. He, he was really great. And he used to take me places every Saturday afternoon, and the show always started uh, with, with, the, with the tagline, the, through bringing you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And on the agony of defeat, there was a, it was a ski jumper coming down the ski lift, or the ski uh, jump, and he fell at the last second, and his head looked like it just about rolled off his shoulders. Turns out he was okay, <laughs> but they, they used that for, I don't know, about decades, but they used it for a long time to start the show. And I'm, I'm like, man, you got me at hello. You, you did. Oh, it sounds like a, a college coach coming to recruit a potential high school athlete yeah. coming to your house, you know, mucking it up, taking you places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It really was. And, and um, you know, w like I said, when, when you get to watch that every day you, and you're, you're in gym shorts or your pajamas or, or whatever and someone's in your house, that, that's, a huge, that's a huge thing. And, and, and uh, I remember being at Fenway Park in Boston and um, it was before a Red Sox game and hanging around home plate um, w was a guy who did the weather in, in New York, and his name was Ira Joe Fisher. And his shtick was he wrote the weather backwards behind a plexiglass uh, screen. And he would write backwards so the viewer would see it forwards. And he had some jokes and some shtick. Well, he's around home plate, nobody knows who the heck it, it is. You would have thought I saw Elvis, because this guy was in my house. And I'm like, oh my God, Ira Joe Fisher. Are you kidding? You're Ira Joe Fisher. He looked at me like, get away from me, kid. You're bothering me. But you're Ira Joe. Can we take a photo of the whole? And that's, that's television, really. That's the power of it. Since you've been in the business, how have you seen sports talk and sports media more generally change? Um, well, I, I think, you know, that's, that's the big thing right there is, is everything is on a personal device now. And, um, you know, that's how my kids, I'm sure that's how you watch. I don't know how anybody watches new programs or hears about new programs. I know that sports television is strong because you've got the games and sports in America, I think will be strong enough, at least for the foreseeable future, that it will bring in viewers. But with regard to prime time and all the other stuff, everybody's on the phone. So um, th I think that's, that's the biggest thing is transitioning to personal devices and watching games, watching any other kind of programming on your phone. And, and for, because of that, you got to make everything bite-sized. You know what I mean? It cannot be a half an hour. It cannot be a, consumable material. Yeah, it's got to be consumable material. And how, ma how many things do you look at, whether it's Instagram, Snapchat, or Twitter, and it's seconds long? You know, or you might not even turn up the volume. I do something uh, every week for before every Eagles game. We call it three things. And it's three things we hate about the week's opponent. Or sometimes it's three things we like, depending on how we want to play it. And some, uh, you know, I, I tell the people we do it with, no one's turning the volume up. You got, we put music on it anyway, but it's, it's like a silent thing where I'm just holding up these place cards. You've got to be animated. 
you got to be animated, but but you also have to. It has to be brief, bite sized, and and you, you're not you're not turning up the sound. You know, you're just watching it right in the feed on your phone. How do you feel about the presence and increasing importance of of social media platforms like Twitter? Uh, in, in, this, in sports media? Well, on the one hand, I feel like they're going to be the end of society. Uh, on the other hand, I think they're extremely important, especially Twitter. Uh, Twitter is like a news gathering tool for me, and, and I do tweet. Most, a lot of times I retweet if I see something that's good versus coming up with my own. You know, you got to be careful what you tweet now. And there's some people that have a unique enough voice that they can tweet whatever the heck they want without any kind of ramification. Um, but Twitter's a Twitter's a nasty, nasty place. Well, you, you've got a pretty big Twitter presence. I was yeah. researching you yesterday, and like thirty tweets from even just yesterday popped up. Was it really? Yeah, it was, was, it, was, it was a lot. Maybe I do tweet a little <laughs> bit, but but a lot, but a lot of them I bet you were retweets. And and, and um, because I'm going through, and I'm, I have lists on Twitter, whether it's whether it's Flyers or hockey, Sixers or basketball, Phillies, and so on. And so I go to those lists. If I'm watching a game, I got pregame or postgame. I'll be on the Flyers list. If I'm if I'm hosting uh, Flyers pregame and postgame, and whatever the news that, that's coming out about the game before or after the game, I have it on that feed on Twitter. So it, it's it's important, and I, I do tweet out if I think it's something important, but I try not to tweet frivolously because it's just not my thing, and I think I'll just get myself in trouble if I do it too much. So 20 years ago. I think sports talk was different in that it wasn't necessarily about the analytics. It's what um, this one podcast I listened listen to called Part of My Take calls Manalytics. It was yeah. about like who's playing harder and who wants it more. Has it been an adjustment for you to talk about the, the analytics of the game more? Yeah, big time. And, and I'm not an analytics guy. And I know that many, in, especially in your generation, they are about analytics. They are about the numbers. And I've, I've really never been about that. I've been about the effort and about the heart. And I know, you know, in this situation, this guy comes up, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna shift because X amount of times he hits into the shift. He's a pull hitter, uh, or, or, or the, the same with football. What kind of defense do you run, and is, or, or whether or not you go for it on fourth down, whether it's stupid or not, what the numbers say. But I'm, I'm more about the feel of it. I'm more about, um, you know, whether or not I think someone can do it in their heart and in their head than I am about what, what the numbers say. And that might be a flaw now uh, of mine, but it's not that I, I ignore the numbers. If I'm talking to somebody who, who um, is talking about the analytics, then, then we go with it. But I'm not, uh, I'm not about that. So you would say you're still more old school? Yeah, big time, big time. So you've also had several roles as a reporter and an interviewer. What's the, what's the most challenging interview you've ever done? Challenging interview I've ever done? Mm, I can't, you know, I, I'd have to think about it. Uh, the, the key to an interview is, is obviously to be prepared. It's to listen to what the other person is saying and to react off that. And, and if you have the knowledge of the subject at hand, then usually you're going to be okay. The worst is, is people who, uh, I'll tell you who is a very Jerry talented. Seinfeld. Are Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah, J Jerry Seinfeld. See, I, I wish he had just said, no thanks, I'd rather not do the interview. Because if I saw him today, I would get right up in his face. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Uh, but, but I wish he, Jerry Seinfeld, if your viewers don't, are not clued in, um, we were at the US Open, it was a Serena Williams match, and I asked him and Larry David if they would uh, do an interview with me. And Larry David said, I'll do it if he'll do it. And I went to Jerry, I said, Larry says he'll do it if you'll do it. And D Jerry said, okay, I'll do it. So I get down there in the stands and I'm asking them questions and, and uh, Larry David is asking the questions, in, uh, answering the questions in earnest. Jerry Seinfeld's like giving me yup and nope. So finally I say to Larry David, and Seinfeld's sitting next to me, and Larry David's other, his other side, I said, what's the funniest thing you've ever seen on a tennis court? And Seinfeld leans in and says, not you. And I said, okay, Ted, John, with that, I'll toss it back to you. And I'm thinking, all right, so you're making a jerk out of me on national television. You could have just said no, but that's the way it goes. Who's number one on your interview bucket list, and where would you interview them? Um, number one on my interview bucket list. I w well, number one I've already done, which is Charles Barkley, just to be, a, whether that's in studio or, or, or anywhere, because he's just a blast, and he's a, he's a guy who is interested in life and interested about things that um, that you're interested in, and he always finds a way to make you the topic of the conversation, so, so he's great. Um, I would love to interview Barack Obama. 
I, I would I would do that anywhere. Um, and whether it was on a basketball court. I was going to say on a basketball yeah, court. <laughs> yeah, or, or a golf course or in his house. Um, he's, uh, I'd love to interview Jimmy Kimmel. I think he's phenomenal at what he does. And, and I think that his, uh, he's, he took an enormous risk in speaking out against the president as he continues to do and hold his feet to the fire as he continues to do. That's not what he, you would think. That's not what he's there for. Um, and yet he comes out every night in his monologue, somehow good-naturedly most of the time, but with a lot of bite. He, he, um, he he's tries, fierce. Yeah, he's, he's fierce. So um, and just watching the way he, he just has a natural wit about him. He is very good with a quip, which is really important. And, and I'm sure, as, as you know from doing this show, there are always gaps. There's always silence. And, and sometimes the silence can be fine. Sometimes it can be deafening. And to have that quip ready to just be that quick mentally to be able to do that is uh, it's it's a skill that uh, I would love to possess. How important is the success of our city sports teams to the overall enjoyment of your day to day job? Huge, huge. I mean, we all want hope in our lives. And, um, you know, for example, the, the Flyers right now have recently again, this is this is going to be airing or, or further from when we're doing it. Uh, the Flyers fired their general manager today, who has really a lifelong flyer in Ron Hextall. And there's, no, there's been no hope with this team. And by hope, I mean that the team can make a playoff, playoffs. And you can say, you know what? If they got hot at the right time, they could do some damage. They could do some things. You don't have that feel about the Flyers. You have that feel about the Sixers, certainly. You still have that feel about the Eagles, even though they're, again, at this time, they're a below 500 team. But maybe by the time this airs... They just beat the Giants. <laughs> they just beat the Giants. Uh, and maybe by the time this airs, they will be headed to, to the playoffs. You don't know. I, I have my doubts. I need to see them win the next game against the Redskins to even up their record and then go down to Dallas and beat Dallas. So there's a lot to that. But I think we look at sports in our town as, as a way that we get hope when maybe our job's a drag or what's going on at home is not good. You still have something live that you can look forward to. Those are our heroes in a sense. And as long as we have that and think, you know what, they, they have a chance, yeah, then everything's okay. What role do you think sports play in the psyche of, of our city? I think that, that, that's also, that's huge. You know, uh, um, I, I think that we, we kind of evaluate ourselves. We, we get our own self-worth from the success or failure of our sports teams. So when the teams are doing well, we're like, yeah, it's a pretty good, this, we, we're sitting pretty. It's a pretty cool town. Everything's pretty. When, when the teams are bad, then we're, I think there's just that little layer of gloom that we might al always otherwise have. Um, but when the teams do well, it's, it's not around. So um, I, I think we, we certainly view ourselves uh, as our teams go. In the last 25 years, how have you seen our city change? I think it's become, um, I hope it's become a little more inclusive. I hope it's become a little more world class um, from a sports angle. You know, I, I know we tried to get the Olympics, and while many might have been laughing at their sleeves down that, I, uh, about that, I could see the Olympics in Philadelphia. I was thinking about, you know, Franklin Field, what they would use that for at, at Penn, what they would how, how, whether the opening ceremonies would be at the link, how you could have sailing either on the river, you could have it off the coast uh, at the Jersey Shore. There would be venues. It would be awesome. You've got it all mapped out. I, 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 you should I'll, be the chair. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think... Um, I, I think in that way we've taken several steps up. I know that people who work in New York now, many many people who work in New York live in Philadelphia because they, they like our our, uh, our vibe, they like our cost of living. Um, and I, I think, I wish there was there were less butting of heads politically and we could get some more things done. But I, th I think that uh, we're definitely more inclusive now. What well-known living or dead Philadelphian do you most admire and why? I would have to say, hang on, let me think about that. I mean, the stock answer has got to be what? A lot of people say Will Smith. Oh, no, I'm not saying Will Smith. <laughs> I love Will Smith. Uh, uh, but, no, I would say Benjamin Franklin. I mean, I would say Benjamin Franklin 
um, be, because this guy invented electricity, invented the printing press. He, he, he signed the Declaration of Independence. He, he was an ambassador to France. The things that he did at that time, I mean, think about that. There's no electricity. There's nothing, man. We're working with a candle at night. And, and um, he, he, um, he, just never, he just never stopped learning, never stopped learning, never stopped plowing forward. And, and um, uh, that, that he has such an effect on Philadelphia to this day, at, what, 350 years since his birth plus, um, is, is amazing. Uh, you think about all the things that are named, the ben, aside from the Ben Franklin Bridge, that have got Franklin on them, and, and that's, that's from the 1600s into the 1700s. Gotta wrap it up. No! <laughs> Thank you so much. A lot of fun. Give me a cheesesteak place. Favorite place to get a cheesesteak? Jim's. Jim's, South Street? Yes. All right, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of fun. Thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate you doing this. If you want to continue following Philly Famous Podcast, find all the episodes on phillyfamouspodcast.com, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your listening in. Again, we're going to do so many more of these episodes with TUTV coming soon. Thanks for watching. Michael, thanks so much. I'm proud of you, buddy. Thank I'm you. I'm proud of you. Keep it going.